I'm Walter Cronkite. This is the story of the rise and fall of a dictator, Benito Mussolini, first fascist leader to rise, first to fall. Today, there is a jazz musician, the cool, modern school. He plays the piano. His father played with history. My name is Romano Mussolini, son of Benito Mussolini. I am 30 years old and I live here in Rome with my mother and younger sister. My main interest in life is music, old music, especially jazz. I play the piano and my father encouraged me in this hobby. I don't take any active part in politics, but naturally, as a citizen of the 20th century, I am aware of the world situation of today. And the world situation of today is not to be pessimistic, a mess. My father was one of the first people who understood what communism meant and fought against it. Let not this be forgotten. What is history's assessment of the Duce of Fascist Italy? In a moment, this story, Benito Mussolini. It is the end of World War I. To Italy, victory has brought depression and disorder. Yesterday's heroes are jobless and hungry. There are strikes, communists who preach revolution. There is a liberal government that temporizes. This is destiny's hour for a glib blacksmith's son, who in turn has been pacifist, school teacher, journalist, and rising socialist. With war, he turned super patriot. With peace, he promises order, pride, territory. His price is power. His panacea is fascism. His name is Benito Mussolini. To him and to fascism flock a million men, angry men, alarmed industrialists, disillusioned veterans. Armed fascism takes the offensive, breaks strikes. Mussolini delivers an ultimatum. Hand over Italy or we seize it. October 28, 1922, while Mussolini cautiously remains behind, Bolder fascists march on Rome. Two days later, Mussolini arrives to become premier, called by King Victor Emmanuel, who prefers fascism to civil war. Within a month, Mussolini turns dictator. Soon the little king comes to hate Mussolini, his bad manners, bombast, broken promises, but grudgingly he does the Duce's bidding. Mussolini plays the selfless leader, pushing public works, creating jobs, turning the Pontine marshes into green farms. Hungry Italy needs leadership. This is the honeymoon. Italy rebuilds, grows healthy, but public adulation is corrupting her leader, converting Mussolini's cynicism into self-confidence, then egomania. To him, Italy has become his own. The man who plays with lions is balding, far-sighted, harassed by war wounds, agonized by ulcers, and orders this cub to a zoo when she scratches him. But fascist Italy must be tough, athletic, virile. He plays his role with an actor's dedication. 
Italy believes the propaganda myth. So does Mussolini. His family life makes good propaganda. His wife, Rochella, is a simple hometown girl, bears him three sons and two daughters. Mussolini is an unfaithful husband, but fond parent. The public sees the man on horseback, not fascism's savage other face. Black shirts brutalize the weakening democratic opposition. In 1924, they murder socialist Giacomo Mattiotti, who speaks out for freedom. Italians are outraged, and Mussolini wavers, indecisive, fearing overthrow. But the anti-fascists fail to act. The beatings and burnings continue. The power solidifies. And through all of this, that essential of totalitarian rule, propaganda, unending propaganda, through every medium, forever shrilling the power of great leader and super state. February 1929, Mussolini, the anti-cleric, the half-believer, formally recognizes the Vatican as a temporal state. But this can be only a truce, for fascism says man belongs to the state, not to his God. The superficial face of fascism impresses many Americans. Now the trains run on time. Italy has discipline, direction. Privately, Mussolini calls the United States a mongrel nation. Publicly, I salute the great American people. I greet the wonderful energy of the American people. And I see and recognize among you the source of your land as well as ours, my fellow citizens who are working to make America great. Mass idolatry turns Mussolini, politician, into Mussolini reincarnated Caesar. He dreams of conquering a new Roman Empire. For this, Italy needs soldiers. So marry, have babies, more babies. Mussolini asks it. The state rewards it with lira. Be patriotic, breed. goal is total indoctrination from childhood to the soldier's grave. Fascism crams young minds with Italy's destiny and the beauty of war. Each boy must bear a bayonet. By the mid-thirties, Mussolini boasts that Italy has eight million bayonets. In 1934, an imitator meets Mussolini for the first time. Adolf Hitler, still uncertain in his new role of Führer, has borrowed openly from fascism and idolizes Mussolini. They meet at Straw, near Venice. The Ducci treats his shabby admirer with easy superiority. Tolerantly, he listens to Hitler's plea for closer ties, then less tolerantly, as Hitler rants of Nordic superiority. Certain he can dominate him, the Ducci later calls this strange German a madman. Humiliated, Hitler plans revenge against Mussolini's good friend, Chancellor Dolphus of Austria. On July 25, 1934, the Dolphus children romp with the Ducci's children at Mussolini's estate. At this moment, in Vienna, Austrian Nazis shoot Dolphus and let him bleed to death. Dolphus is buried and Mussolini, furious at Hitler, orders his troops to the border to intervene for Austrian freedom. The Duchy frightens the Fuhrer. Unready for war, Hitler disowns his agents. The putsch fails and Mussolini gets the credit. Europe hails the Duchy as the savior of the peace. At Streza, France and Britain join him in an anti-German front. And now Mussolini offends the world. On October 2nd, 1935, he orders his people to war against Ethiopia. 
The enemy is half-clad, ill-armed, ruled by Emperor Haile Selassie. A backward but proudly independent African people, their fathers had overwhelmed Italian aggressors in 1896. Mussolini promises Italy vengeance and empire. And so 170,000 Italians go to war, as Italians will do until fascism is consumed by the wars it glorifies. It is a small, safe war, the kind Mussolini likes. Even Bruno Mussolini volunteered. At the League of Nations, Italian diplomats boo Haile Selassie. It is Selassie. I call upon the first delegate, Mr. Mr. President. Mussolini turns his little war into an exercise in national discipline and sacrifice. Women obediently trade gold wedding bands for steel. Wedding rings buy bombs. Unopposed Italian air power ranges over defenseless villages. Pilot Vittorio Mussolini tells how his bombs bloomed like a deadly rose on Ethiopian columns and says, war is the quintessence of beauty. By May of 1936, Mussolini has won Ethiopia and doomed the League of Nations. Roma! Two months later, Franco's conservatives revolt against Spain's Republican government. Mussolini, approving politically, intervenes with men, arms, money. But war in Spain drags on until Italians grumble against their duce. In 1937, Hitler invites Mussolini to Germany. What the duce sees is beyond his wildest dream. Overwhelming, brutal power organized to inflexible conquest of men's minds and freedom. The Rome-Berlin axis is formed, but now the coin has turned. Hitler, with his display of iron, is master. Mussolini, the camp follower. March 1938. Certain of Mussolini's subservience, Hitler strikes, incorporating Austria into his Reich. Envious, the Duce imports the one thing he can have from Hitler, the goose step. In 1938, Rome gives Hitler a spectacular welcome. The new goose step is the icing on the cake. Mussolini agrees to German military assistance and, to the disgust of racially tolerant Italy, introduces anti-Semitism. Behind the scenes, all is not so tranquil. Mussolini claims the little king is upstaging him, and Hitler finds his welcome lacking in warmth. Publicly, all is unity. On parting, Mussolini says, henceforth, no force can separate us. September 1938. Czechoslovakia, whose German minority clamors obediently for protection, waits for Hitler to attack. The Czechs are ready to fight for their freedom, but the democratic leaders, fearful of general war, choose appeasement instead. They ask Mussolini to intervene with Hitler. The result? The Munich Conference. The result for unrepresented Czechoslovakia, partition and defeat. Drained by Spain, wanting peace desperately, Italy gives the architect of Munich a hero's welcome. Now 
he can do no wrong. Even his private life is overlooked. Italians only wink at as many women, the last being Clara Petacci, green-eyed, shapely, 29 years his junior. Some grumble over her influence, but she remains his last enduring passion. Hitler strikes again, seizing what Munich left of Czechoslovakia. Mussolini feels compelled to attack someone. Carefully, he chooses his victim, Albania. There's another safe little war against one million Balkan peasants. Victory is swift. Conquered Albania joins the new Roman Empire. September 1939, Hitler blitzes Poland and World War II begins. Italians want peace and in the hour of decision, Mussolini wavers. His advisors warn Italy is unequipped for major war. Mussolini proclaims Italy a non-belligerent, a neutral favoring Germany. Victory follows German victory, and when the Fuhrer and Ducci next meet at Brenner in March 1940, Mussolini listens like an admiring schoolboy. Mussolini gives Hitler his commitment. Italy will go to war at the first opportune moment. June 10, 1940, Italians assemble to hear their destiny. Mussolini's announcement, war against Britain, the dagger into France. For the first time in 18 years, the Duce seriously misjudges his people. The crowd is stunned. They are sick of war. They dislike the Germans. They fear disaster. The Ducci orders the usual preparations for victory. He informs Hitler, we are on the march. The March, October 1940. He attacks Greece, but his half-hearted, ill-equipped troops are repulsed by the tough Greek army. Finally, Hitler has to send the Wehrmacht to rescue him. At the next meeting with the Fuhrer, Berchtesgaden, January 1941, Mussolini after Greece is little more than Hitler's lackey for Italy. Crisis follows crisis now. He is in a big war, not in Ethiopia or Albania. The new ordeal is North Africa. Again, the Germans have had to come to his rescue, but this time they too are reeling back as the British attack in savage counteroffensive. There is still adulation, but now he walks with the air of a poseur. Now people ask questions, have the audacity to complain. still fanatics who hero worship him. They only distort the true picture. <laughs> Military disaster becomes collapse. In November 1942, American ground forces join the battle in Africa. The beaten Axis army surrenders. Ahead lies invasion of Italy, his Italy. At home, hungry, despairing Italians see Sicily overrun in 38 days. For Italy, the fascist dream has become a nightmare. July 24th, 1943. The Grand Council of Fascism meets. The king is determined to overthrow Mussolini. By 19 to 6, the council supports Victor Emmanuel. The Duce is stripped of his power, then arrested. 
6,000 feet of Gran Sasso, the broken gargoyle of Rome goes into exile. A new government proclaims armistice with the Allies. Then Hitler compounds Italy's tragedy. On September 12, 1943, German parachutists rescue Mussolini. They find a docile, mechanically smiling Duce, aging, sick, and eager to do the Germans' bidding. They fly him to his master. Publicly, Hitler welcomes Mussolini. Privately, the Fuhrer is bitter, disillusioned by Italy's proving more Italian than fascist, contemptuous of Mussolini's personal surrender. The Duce is dutifully bussed by Otto Scorzini, his rescuer's commander. Then, pathetic and afraid, he pleads for return to his native Romagna and obscurity. Hitler will have none of it. He needs a symbol and sends Mussolini south to play the puppet. Far from the front, the tired actor forms a fascist republic on German Q and goes through the old postures. Only Nazi power preserves the squalid fiction. His followers are the scum of fascism. Slowly, bloodily, the Allied armies fight through mountains laced with German defenses. Win Naples, Casino, and finally, Rome. It is the beginning of the end. and Mussolini last meet July 20th, 1944. Scant hours after an anti-Nazi bomb wounds Hitler's right arm, which he holds stiffly to his side. In private meetings, Mussolini listens as the Nazi leaders quarrel, and Hitler screams accusation. Now, too late, the Italian realizes his German idol is irrational and doomed. Finally, Allied armies drive beyond the Po. Partisans swarm from hiding. Mussolini's fascist republic collapses. He flees northward and is captured. April 28, 1945, communist partisans shoot Mussolini against a garden wall. Hitachi chooses to die beside him. In 1957, Italy exhumes Mussolini's hidden body. His widow and neo-fascist mourners bury him in his native village, Predapio. In the Duce's heyday, his countrymen forgave his faults and cheered him as their champion. His own profound shortcomings, along with Hitler's evil magnetism, left the Italian people a legacy of suffering, and Mussolini a blood-stained puppet's place in history.